What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video today, we're going to be talking about penile disorders, and there is a lot to go over, so let's get right into it. So when we talk about these disorders, we're going to break it up into the different components, such as the glands, penis, and the foreskin disorders, and then we'll go on a little bit further. So the first thing that I need you guys to be able to realize is certain disorders that involve the glands, penis, and the foreskin. One is called balanitis. Now, balanitis, as you can see here around the actual glands, penis, and even just a teensy bit towards the foreskin, there's definitely some irritation and inflammation. Usually, this is due to an infection, most likely candida, so some type of fungal infection. Oftentimes, it's due to just poor hygiene and not being able to clean this particular area. Now, another one is called balanopostitis. So this is basically balanitis, which is involving the glands penis, but then it extends a little bit further to involve the actual foreskin. So both of those are inflamed. Again, this is usually due to a candidal infection that's the result of poor hygiene. Another one is called phimosis. Phimosis is basically where the patient is unable to retract the foreskin backwards over the glands penis, and it's literally stuck like this. So because of this, this is going to be what we would define as phimosis. Usually this can be congenital. There's some type of adhesions that are altering us from pulling that back completely, um, or patients have underlying balanitis and balanopostitis, which inflames the glands penis and the foreskin, and that inflammation itself won't allow for them to retract that inflamed foreskin back. Another one's called paraphimosis, and this is basically whenever the foreskin kind of forms like a ring and gets stuck right after the glans penis. So right before you get to the glans penis, it's stuck and you can't return it back over the glans penis. So it's kind of like the opposite of phimosis. Here's the actual foreskin. It's stuck right here like a very tight ring and you just can't bring it back over the glans penis. So in this particular scenario, this is often due to a patient who has partial phimosis. So in other words, they have like a phimosis that they tried to retract a little bit back and it got stuck, and now it's not able to, not able to be returned back over the glans penis. And the next way I want to describe this is usually penile disorders that are involving the shaft of the penis that are more likely to be traumatic. Um, the big things to remember with this one is Peyronie's disease. So Peyronie's disease is usually going to be to these fibrous penile plaques. So you develop a lot of fibrous tissue that develops around the length of the actual uh, penis. And usually what happens is these fibrous plaques lead to abnormal curvature of the penis. And one of the biggest kind of reasons of why this happens is if you kind of cut this penis here in half and you look, you'll see here's the fibrous plaque right over the area of the corpus cavernosum. Oftentimes this is usually due to repeated penile trauma during sexual activity. Another one is a penile fracture. So this is a very severe case. Oftentimes, in this particular scenario here, as you see the penile fracture, it's due to a complete rupture of the tunica albuginea. So I literally ruptured this thing in half, and that's usually the triggers. I cut through the corpus cavernosum, and I cut through the tunica albuginea, and that's usually the potential etiology here. Oftentimes, that's due to a severe penile trauma. The next one that I want to talk about with respect to the penile disorders is the erectile disorder. So we went through the glands, penis, and foreskin. We went through traumatic penile disorders that caused either fibrous penile plaques to form on the corpus cavernosum or rupturing of the corpus cavernosum and the tunica albuginea. In this scenario, we're talking about issues where patients kind of maintain. Um, unfortunately, they, they develop and maintain an erection or they have difficulty developing and maintaining an erection. So the first one is priapism. So priapism is a painful and prolonged erection for usually greater than four hours because this is relatively concerning. As we start getting beyond this up to six hours, we start increasing the risk of penile ischemia. So the concept behind this is that there's two different types of priapism. One is a low flow and the other one is a high flow. So here's a patient who has a normal erection. So they have normal arterial inflow, normal venous outflow, right? Now, the biggest thing that happens here with low flow priapism is that they have a reduced arterial inflow, and the reason why is usually their venous outflow is blocked. There's a couple different reasons for this. The most common reason is usually the patient has erectile dysfunction, which we're gonna talk about in a second, and they take something called phosphodiesterase inhibitors, which help to promote increased blood flow into the penis, which compresses the veins and leads to them not being able to allow blood to exit out, which then leads to a prolonged erection. The other reason would usually be due to sickle cell disease, where you know, some of the actual sickle cells get stuck in the actual venous outflow tract, and they can't allow for blood to exit the penis, which again causes it to become engorged, and it won't be able to allow for enough oxygen-rich blood to deliver into the actual penile tissue, especially the corpus cavernosum. And oftentimes because of that, if I don't have enough good arterial oxygen coming into this area, if I were to take an arterial sample here from the cavernous tissue, it would be very poor in oxygen, very rich in you know, CO2 and very 
very rich in protons. So there'd definitely be some evidence of acidosis here and hypoxemia in this particular area. In contrast, in a patient who has like a non-ischemic high flow uh, priapism, it's usually due to arterial cavernosal fistula. And so in this patient, they have an excessive amount of blood that's running into the penis arterial, lots of high amounts of oxygen that are actually being delivered here. And again, somewhat of a normal flow coming out of the actual venous outflow tract, but in comparison to the arterial flow, it's much more intense. And this is one of the reasons why they're able to maintain erection here is because of the massive increased arterial blood flow. The next type of erectile disorder is usually called erectile dysfunction. So this is the inability to acquire and then maintain an erection. And usually what happens here is here we're going to have like a cut portion of the penis where you can see the corpus cavernosum here. What happens in this particular process here is there's a couple different etiologies that I want you to remember. One is it could be psychogenic. Um, usually this is in the form of anxiety. Um, anxiety, usually sexual anxiety, anticipating the act of sex, the patient may develop this potential process. What happens is that anxiety may propagate a sympathetic nervous system activity. Now, whenever the sympathetic nervous system is hyperactive, it kind of dampens down the parasympathetic nervous system, and that's a problem because the parasympathetic nervous system is responsible for releasing acetylcholine. And acetylcholine is supposed to then help to propagate an increase in nitric oxide in the corpus cavernosum. And if there is a reduction in nitric oxide, we won't be able to allow for us to dilate those arteries, which increases blood flow into the corpus cavernosum, allowing for it to fill, become congested, and then promote an erection. All right? So because of this, if I have an increase in sympathetic activity because of sexual anxiety, I'll suppress my parasympathetic nervous system, suppress acetylcholine, drop my nitric oxide release, drop arterial inflow, and not be able to expand the cavernosa. And that will lead to the inability to obtain as well as maintain the erection. The next potential causes could be endocrine diseases, and there's lots of them. I think one is usually hypogonadism, usually due to low FSH and LH. This could be due to hypopituitaryism. Another one is it could be due to high prolactin production. So high prolactin has been shown that it can actually suppress FSH and LH. And this may also lead to some problems. And the last one is usually due to high T4 or low T4, so hypo and hyperthyroidism. So hypothyroidism can actually stimulate an increase of prolactin production. And then high T4, hyperthyroidism, can actually increase the production of sex hormone binding globulins, which bind up sex hormones like testosterone and reduce the free amount of that testosterone. So what you're seeing in all of these scenarios is either way, it's a reduction in FSH, LH, prolactin, or hypohyperthyroidism that's leading to a reduction in testosterone. And patients who have low testosterone, they naturally have difficulty in being able to maintain erections because that's one of the main functions of testosterone. Another one's neurogenic problems. So usually this is something where the nervous system is having difficulty mediating the spinal reflexes to trigger this parasympathetic nervous system activity to release acetylcholine. This is usually neurological diseases in the forms of strokes, maybe spinal cord injuries, and diabetic neuropathy. The next one is usually uh, peripheral artery disease. And peripheral artery disease, usually, um, it has to be involving the aorta and the iliac vessels because off of those comes the blood vessels that supplies via the pudendal artery, which supplies the penis. And these patients, if they have peripheral artery disease, so they have plaques that are occluding the actual aorta or iliac vessels, that'll lead to a reduced supply of blood, oxygen-rich blood, to the actual pudendal artery, which will lead to reduced arterial inflow into the penis, reduced expansion, and the inability to acquire and maintain an erection. The next one is substance abuse. And usually this is particularly substances that have been shown to suppress parasympathetic nervous system activity and reduce acetylcholine release. And the two most common offenders tend to be antipsychotics as well as uh, SSRs, so selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Now, we talked a lot about the different types of penile disorders, glands, foreskin, traumatic penile, and erectile dysfunction. What are the downstream consequences of these disorders that you have to be aware of? Well, we already kind of talked about this a little bit with balanitis and blanopostitis. They increase the risk of you know, phimosis, but what's some other things? We know, that, again, that if you have balanitis, it inflames the glands, penis, it prevents you from being able to, um, if you inflame the actual uh, the glands, it prevents the retraction of the foreskin. And you can't pull the foreskin backwards, and that can increase the risk of phimosis. The other comp uh, complex there is that with balanopostitis, again, inflames the gland's penis, 
and the foreskin, and that makes it really difficult to be able to retract the prepuce, retract the actual foreskin backwards. And this can lead to phimosis. With phimosis, the downstream consequences of this is if you try to retract the actual foreskin and it gets stuck right around the actual base of the glands penis and you aren't able to return that over, it can lead to paraphimosis and paraphimosis can lead to penile ischemia. Here's the downside. In patients who have phimosis that is completely untreated, very long term, it can increase the risk of kind of inflammation and it does have a very consistent corresponding with penile cancer. With paraphimosis, we already talked about this. Imagine having this tight ring around the glands penis, right around the neck of it. You're gonna reduce pretty much all oxygen-rich blood to the tip of the penis. And so this will cause massive penile ischemia to the tip of the penis, all right? The next one is Peyronie's disease. So Peyronie's disease, you have these fibrous plaques that are basically on the area of the corpus cavernosum, and it'll literally compress the corpus cavernosum. And if you're compressing it, you're not going to allow it for it to be adequately filled and maintain a good erection. So in these patients, they oftentimes experience erectile dysfunction. Priapism is definitely a pretty bad one. And the reason why is if a patient who has low flow priapism, you're allowing for, again, very little blood to get in and pretty much no blood to get out. That leaves the penis relatively congested. Now, because I'm not allowing for arterial you know, blood to get in, I'm not delivering as much oxygen to the penile tissue. If I don't deliver oxygen to the penile tissue because of that decreased venous outflow, that can definitely lead to penile ischemia. And this is very problematic because it can lead to severe problems. One of the big things is that if you don't deliver oxygen to the tissue, it will die. That will then lead to cavernosal fibrosis. And this can over time lead to the inability to maintain erections because if you cause fibrosis of the cavernosum, you're not gonna be able to fill it with blood because that's not the function of it now. You lost the normal spongy function of that cavernosal tissue. And now it'll have difficulty being able to develop and maintain erections. I think the big thing to remember is whenever a patient comes in, and you're trying to evaluate them to separate them into these particular categories that we talked about. So blanitis and blanopostitis fits more of the glans penis particular problems. So in these patients, I would literally look and say, do they have an inflamed glans penis? Oh, there it is, that's blanitis, done. It's more of a, a visual diagnostic. Inflamed glans penis and the actual foreskin of the prepuce, that's likely blanopostitis. Phimosis is the glands, um, sorry, the foreskin is basically not able to be retracted over the glands penis. And then paraphimosis is I can't bring the actual foreskin back over the base of the glands penis. Again, risk of these is uh, phimosis. The risk of phimosis is that this can lead to penile cancer. And the risk of paraphimosis is penile ischemia. The next one is Peyronie's versus a penile fracture. It's based upon the overall look. So if I see that the patient has penile pain, they have painful erections, and they have an abnormal curvature, this is likely Peyronie's disease. But if I see that there's penile pain, they have an eggplant appearance and very swollen, I mean bruised appearance to their actual penis, this suggests a penile fracture. Again, Peyronie's can lead to increased risk of the patient having things like erectile dysfunction. High flow versus low flow priapism. It's all about the blood flow into the penis. So again, you have to remember, if I were to, this sounds incredibly painful, but if I were to stick a needle into the corpus cavernosum, draw off a arterial blood gas sample, and then I took an ultrasound and I put the ultrasound over the actual penis and I looked at the blood flow through the penis, I should be able to tell two things. One, is if there is normal oxygen, that means that I have normal arterial inflow and maybe even a good amount of it. If I have increased blood flow, that tells me that there's a lot of blood flow coming through the artery. That tells me that there's a high flow state. It can't be low flow, it has to be light, low, uh, it has to be high flow. So in this particular situation, I think that the patient has a high flow priapism and the most common etiology is usually arteriocavernosal fistula. So again, normal oxygen, they're delivering a lot of oxygen because they have a lot of arterial inflow. You pick up a lot of increased blood flow on the Doppler, that's because they have a lot of arterial inflow. The other scenario is low oxygen and decreased blood flow. This is because they have venous congestion due to some type of venous blockade that's congesting the penis and it's reducing the penile inflow. And if I reduce the penile inflow, this is gonna precipitate severe hypoxia because I'm not delivering an adequate amount of oxygen because I'm not giving enough arterial inflow. The tissue will start to have a lot of CO2, a lot of acidosis that'll start to also arise. This would be super evident of low flow priapism. 
Now, from this, we've diagnosed the, you know, the extent of all of the penile disorders except for one more, which is just a little bit more intense. All right, let's talk about the diagnostic approach to erectile dysfunction. So in this patient, you have to figure out what's the underlying reason that they're developing erectile dysfunction. So oftentimes it involves a pretty thoughtful look into the patient's history, maybe some additional tests. The most common test that usually patients will get worked up for is hypogonadism. Do they have low testosterone? Do they have hypopituitarism that they're not making enough FSH and LH? Do they have hyperlactin from a prolactinoma? Do they have hypo or hyperthyroidism? And so it's important to send those tests off and see if they come up. And if they do, that could tell you the endocrine cause. It's a little bit of a stretch, but I think in patients who you suspect has peripheral artery disease, maybe they have decreased pulses, uh, maybe they have claudication around the uh, hips and buttock area. And on top of that, have erectile dysfunction. You should think about Lariche syndrome. And that's usually a patient who has underlying atherosclerosis of their aortoiliacs. Um, and so in those particular scenarios, it's good to risk stratify them, check an A1C lipid panel, ankle brachial index. And the ABI, if that's less than 0 0.9, it suggests PAD. And you just have to figure about where out it is. And if it's an aortoiliac disease, um, such as, again, presenting with buttock pain, hip pain, decreased pulses and erectile dysfunction, it could indicate a vascular cause. Another one is like neurogenic. There's a lot of different neurogenic causes. Strokes, you know, could be one. Spinal cord injury could be a really big one. Um, even like diabetic neuropathy. So I think oftentimes it's about checking to see if they have any other neurological deficits, such as poor anal tone, poor lower limb sensation, because this may indicate that there's a neurogenic cause to their erectile dysfunction. And that may elucidate further tests, such as brain and spinal cord imaging. However, if you've gone down and you've really tried to figure out that there really is no identifiable cause and it's still unclear why the patient's remaining to have ED, then what you can do is you can do a nocturnal penile tumescence. And basically you look to see if they have an erection overnight. Um, if it's usually not present so they don't develop an erection, this suggests an organic cause. It means that this is definitely real. And you have to go ahead and figure out what else this could be. And you might have to go down the rabbit hole of discontinuing SSRIs, discontinuing antipsychotics, whatever it may be. But if it's positive and they do are, you know, develop erection during the night, then this suggests more likely a psychogenic cause, maybe like sexual anxiety related as the potential trigger here. All right. Now, We've come to the end, which is how do we treat all of these different penile disorders? It really depends upon which one. So if a patient has blanitis and blanopostitis, it's a candidal infection. It's usually poor hygiene. So you know, improve the hygiene, right? Sometimes saline irrigation, cleaning that area out during showers, as well as eradicating the infection, such as the candida infection with topical antifungals. For phimosis, oftentimes for these patients, you may not really you know, do anything. It may just reassure the patient. But I think in some patients, if they start to develop issues where they are uncomfortable with this, you can consider a surgical incision if that doesn't improve. In paraphimosis, this one's a little bit more aggressive. So I would say if a patient has paraphimosis, your goal is to try to get rid of the actual preputal ring here. And so oftentimes you may start, if it really is wrapped around and you can't kind of bring it over the glands penis, you may try your best to give them a little bit of pain medication and try to see if you can manually bring it back to that position. But if it doesn't work or they start to develop any evidence of penile ischemia, you may have to cut that preputal ring so that they don't develop any penile ischemia to their glands penis. All right, my friends, let's now move on to the treatment of traumatic penile disorders, which again includes the Peyronie's and penile fracture. So with Peyronie's, again, we see that the problem is really is an abnormal curvature from these fibrous penile plaques. We have to then kind of ask ourselves the question, how do we treat this? A component of it's really pain. The other component of it is preventing further fibrosis and inflammation. The other one is trying to break down the fibrosis, and the other one is just complete surgical management. So that can be kind of extensive. So let's talk a little bit about this in more detail. So there's two phases of Peyronie's. One is when they're in the active throes of it. In other words, they're experiencing pain. They're experiencing an abnormal change in the curvature of their penis from usual. So that one, we oftentimes try to treat the pain with NSAIDs and patoxifilin. Now, patoxifilin has been shown to have a little bit of control in pain. But it's more specifically, it reduces the inflammation, which may help to reduce pain. But it's also been shown to reduce fibrosis, which helps to reduce the risk of the curvature. Now, to kind of go over this, if a patient is having a pain that's going on with erection, it tells me that they're definitely having some active phase going on. And if they have changes in their penile curvature from usual, it tells me that there's some active fibrosis going on. So my goal is to try to treat the pain, right? And so usually that's going to be giving them NSAIDs. 
it also can be considering pentoxifylin. NSAIDs are usually initially given and then pentoxifylin can also be considered. Either way, treat the pain. The question that you have to ask yourself is after you're treating them with the NSAIDs is are they getting any better? If they are getting better, then you should continue them on pentoxifylin. The reason why is that'll give anti-inflammatory effect, but it'll also reduce the risk of further fibrosis, therefore preventing the changes in the curvature. If no improvement is taking place, they're already laying down the fibrous tissue, <clears throat> it's probably a little bit too late. They may benefit more at this point in time from intralesional injections of collagenase. And this is where you inject the collagen into the area of where the fibrous plaque is and try to break down that fibrous plaque and hopefully restore some curvature and reduce pain during erection due to the compression of the capora cavernosa. And again, this is just an example of illustrating the interlesional collagenase in injection into the fibrous plaque. If the patient's in the stable phase, this means that they're not really experiencing any more like active fibrosis. They have no pain with erection. They have no new changes in the penile curvature, but they already have an existing penile curvature that's already present from the prior uh, fibrosis of the, the actual Kapoor cavernosa. So if there's no pain with erection, no changes in the penile curvature from usual, this is a stable phase. At this point, pentoxifalin is not going to be effective. It's really just going to be intralesional collagenase or a surgical procedure, really. But the decision upon which you make that is based upon if the degree of curvature is significant. Is it greater than 30 degrees or less than 30 degrees? Because if it's less than 30 degrees, it's probably best to not do anything aggressive and just probably observe. But if it is greater than 30 degrees, then the next question you have to ask is, is do they have any erectile dysfunction? Or is the deformity so severe, being that it's greater than 30 degrees, that it's altering the patient's lifestyle, usually their sexual lifestyle? If it is, then in these particular scenarios, you have to ask yourself the question, okay, if it's not, I can probably get away with doing some more intralesional collagenase injections to try to break down some of that actual fibrous tissue. If it is, it's probably best at this point to just go in and surgically remove those fibrous plaques. And that's how we would go about treating this patient with Peyronie's. With the penile fracture, it's really about trying to get rid of all of the hematoma that is existing between the tissues of the tunica albuginea and the copora cavernosa. And so oftentimes you have to evacuate that and suture those areas closed like the tunica albuginea. So a surgical repair in that particular scenario is the best choice. Treatment of erectile disorders really depends. Are you talking about priapism or are you talking about erectile dysfunction? So if we're talking about priapism, the ischemic priapism is what we refer to as the low flow priapism. And this is the one that's usually due to sickle cell could be due to leukostasis, like patients who have acute myeloblastic leukemia, they have so much like blast cells that get stuck in the venous outflow tract. Or it could be due to drugs that are actually excessively dilating the penile arterioles and causing so much blood flow in there that it's actually congesting the penis and compressing the venous outflow tract and not allowing blood to go out. So in these particular scenarios, you have to ask yourself, okay, if it's low flow, try your best to treat the underlying cause. And if you can, great. If you can't, you have to get the blood out of the penis because if not, these patients can start to experience potential ischemia, right? And this can be problematic. So how do we go about doing this? The first one sounds absolutely terrible, but just stick a needle into the Kapoor cavernosa and suck some of the blood out so that hopefully you can reduce the congestion of the veins that are in that vicinity and allow for venous drainage. So it's kind of like here's the kind of the veins here. This Kapoor cavernosa is so engorged right now that it's compressing the veins. If you reduce the size of the Kapoor cavernosa, you'll open up the veins and allow for blood to exit, which will help to eliminate the erection. Another option is if this does not work, you can give them intra uh, cavernosal phenylephrine. So oftentimes you may stick a needle in and on the other side, you're injecting in phenylephrine. The concept behind phenylephrine is it actually can squeeze the, um, the penile arteries. And by squeezing the penile arteries, that may sound terrible. They're like, dude, okay, wait, there's already reduced blood flow. Isn't that gonna cause more ischemia? The concept behind this is that you have to stop further blood going into the penis, stop further congestion. So if you constrict the penile arterioles, you'll reduce blood flow going into the capora cavernosa. You'll reduce its expansion. And hopefully by reducing its expansion, you will kind of decompress these veins and improve venous outflow out of the penis and hopefully eliminate the erection. 
Oftentimes, most patients will respond to this. In these severe situations where they do not respond and they're starting to develop penile ischemia, we oftentimes have to cut into the penis and cut into the intracavernosal area. So sometimes there's different types of shunting techniques. This looks absolutely painful. Believe me, I know. I cringe when I see this, but you can stick a biopsy needle in here, put holes in between the skin and the capora cavernosa and allow for the blood to drain out this way. That's shunting the blood a different direction. Another one is you can use a scalpel, punch that into this area through the actual glands penis into the capora cavernosa and allow the blood to shunt that way. And the last one is just a T-shunt, thus the name. You kind of indirect the scalpel in through the glands penis into the capora cavernosa, change the direction, hit it in the horizontal section, and allow for the blood to drain outwards. And this will allow for definitive blood drainage. It looks terrifying when I look at it, but it will help to decompress the actual cavernosa, allow for it to become decongested, and help to uh, eliminate the erection. This is how we would treat the low-flow priapism. And patients who have high flow, it's all about that arteriocavernosal fistula. We got to stop that thing. Oftentimes, you shouldn't really do anything about it unless you absolutely need to. So it's oftentimes just about observing. And if they're still having problems, you can consider in these particular scenarios, if they have recurrent priapism episodes, you could do something called an embolization where you embolize the arteriocavernosal fistula so that you stop this excessive arterial blood flow into the penis. That's one thing. And if that doesn't work, you can literally ligate that arteriocavernosal fistula off. And that would be the alternative option here if that fails. We come to the last disorder of, you know, our penile disorders, which is erectile dysfunction. In this patient, you're trying to help them achieve an erection. And usually the way that we do that is by increasing the blood flow into the corpus cavernosum, expanding it, compressing the venous outflow tract, not letting blood exit, which helps us to maintain the erection. We kind of know that mechanism based upon this concept here. So if we direct our attention here, our parasympathetic nervous system is going to be releasing acetylcholine. That tells the endothelium within the area to increase nitric oxide release. That increases cyclic GMP. That basically helps to keep calcium from coming into these cells. That helps the smooth muscle cells to then relax. If the smooth muscle then relaxes appropriately, that will allow for arterial vasodilation and increased amount of blood to flow into the penis. That it will then cause the cavernosum to start to expand. And as it expands, they start to experience a direction. As the cavernosum expands, it then compresses the venous outflow, reducing the ability for blood to get out of the penis, which helps them to maintain an erection. So our job is at some point in this pathway to try to help these patients. And where we can really do it is right here. And that's one mechanism. So we can give these uh, drugs uh, potentially after we try to treat reversible causes in ED, such as maybe a hypotestosterone, so that they have low testosterone, hypogonadism. Try to treat those underlying causes. Maybe you have to give the patient TRT if they're having low te testosterone. And if that doesn't work, sometimes in the interim as you're letting these drugs work, you may have to start them on a PDE5 inhibitor, which the patient will take before they have sexual intercourse. And what happens is this drug, which is gonna be things like you know, sildenafil and tadalafil, well, what they'll do is they'll inhibit this enzyme called PDE5. If this enzyme is inhibited, it won't be able to convert and break down cyclic GMP into GMP. As a result, I'll have higher levels of cyclic GMP and then less calcium influx, and I'll propagate this pathway downwards, increase arterial blood flow, and, and, and cause cavernosal expansion. Erection will then become forming, right? Sometimes patients won't respond to this. And if that's the case, usually you have to upgrade a little bit and you go to more of a not so comfortable thing like an injection. And again, before the patient is about to have sexual intercourse, they'll then inject usually this kind of like pellet. It's called um, alprostadil. And alprostadil is a PGE1 agonist. And what it's going to do is it's going to hit a PGE1 receptor. That's going to then, as a result, increase cyclic AMP, which then helps to reduce this uh, calcium influx, and then propagates this pathway and leads to cavernosal expansion, compresses the venous outflow, and allows for the development and maintenance of an erection. Oftentimes, if that fails, then sometimes before sexual intercourse, you can use vacuum devices to create a, you know, a pressure to allow for the engorgement of the penis before that type of act. Oftentimes, if these things usually fail, we go to the last particular scenario here, which is a patient may be consulted for a penile prosthesis to allow for them whenever it's necessary, they can trigger this process where they push in, it's kind of saline into this cylinder that allows for it to expand and allow for the individual to develop an erection on their own accord and desire before the act of sex. 
And again, this is the way that we would go about treating erectile dysfunction with the caveat that again, you try to treat reversible causes if possible. All right, my friends, that's how we talk about our penile disorders. I really hope that they made sense. I really hope that you guys learned a lot and enjoyed it. And as always, thank you, love you. And until next time. Mm -hmm.